Tiller lenses can be very expensive. In comparison, beginner's telescopes are relatively cheap. But are they a serious alternative? What is the image quality? And what are the applications? So today, I want to share my experiences about combining my Leica CL with the beginner's telescope, the Neat ETEX 90. One of the early adapters of compact telescopes was the American-made Quester, which had been produced in New Hope Bucks County starting in 1954. It is sometimes referred to as the Rolls-Royce of compact telescopes. I still have the catalog here from the 70s, and it was very expensive. In 1996, Meet Instruments came up with a telescope that looked almost identical to the Questar, the Meet ETX 90. This scope caused kind of a hype because it was just one tenth of the price of the Questar, and it looked so similar. Meet had cut corners to make it inexpensive, not so much in the optics department, but in the mechanics. We will find precise aluminum and steel design in the Questar need to, let's say, a more plastically approach. Before I go on, just to note that the ETX 90 is still available. It has seen improvements in the mount, electronics, and computerization. And it should also be noted that some other companies like Celestron offer similar entry-level telescopes. Both the Questar and the ETX 90 are so-called catadioptic, meaning combined lens and mirror systems, realized here as a Maxutov Cassegrain design. Light goes through a correction plate of 3.5 inch in size, is reflected by the primary mirror onto a secondary mirror, which is a reflective coating on the corrector lens, and focused back through a hole in the primary mirror for visual viewing or for using a camera port. There are primary and secondary baffles to reduce internal reflections. When taking the scope out of the box after 20 years of storage, I noticed that the secondary baffle had moved, causing obstruction. This is a common problem with the older systems, and you may pay attention to it when you buy a used ETX90. After I removed the corrector lens from the tube, you see that the bubble is not centric to the reflective area. There's a good ETX user base and you can find tricks and tips. Encouraged, I tried fixing the problem myself. After pulling the battle off, the ring gluing the baffle was still sticking to the lens and I used a wooden stick to get under the ring and pulled it off with a tweezer. Nothing for the faint hearted because you have to be very careful to not scratch the surface. Next, I used Volpog 3M sticky adhesive, the stuff you use to mount your cell phone holder onto your windscreen, and cut it out a new ring. After cleaning any residues with 50% alcohol, I glued the baffle back. Of note, you only have one attempt. I let the corrector lens sit as a weight on the baffle for 40 eight hours for the glue to develop full strength, did the final cleaning of the lens and screwed it back onto the tube. Finally, we are ready to combine the telescope with the camera. This is a view from the back with the CL mounted to the scope using an L-mount adapter. It's a nice fitting since the camera is relatively compact. What you get is a system of 1,250 millimeter focal lengths, and the aperture is 13.8. Minimal focal distance is about 10 feet, and the images are bright. You can conveniently flip between visual and photographic ports, but you will need to adjust the focus. What is the overall image quality of the meat in combination with the Leica CL? This is an example of imaging conifer cones in a distant pine tree. 50 yards away. This is a field of view you get with a 75 millimeter lens, with a 400 millimeter lens, and with the ETX 90. Notice the figure netting in this JPEG image in the uniform sky in the background. 
which would become worse with the full frame sensor. From that point of view, APC cameras are perfect for the small pupil size or Ausdruck's pupil of telescopes. When you use RAW, you have more play with the dynamic range to lighten up darker areas. The mount of the ETX is not sturdy enough to establish good tracking with the camera attached. There's no way to balance the extra weight, which is a moderate increase given the compactness of the CL. However, even without tracking, you can take images like this picture of the moon. The estimated size of objects like craters you can resolve on the moon's surface is somewhere around two months. And here, I just let the moon go through the field of view without tracking using video mode. Notice that the focal length is just right to image the moon in full size, and you get an idea how quickly objects move through the field of view. You can also take photographs of the sun, which is a very dynamic object. Caution is needed, and you should never look through the viewfinder, and of course, not through the telescope. Use a decent full glass solar filter, like the one I'm using from Spectrum Telescope. The best way to orient your telescope is to use the shadow that it casts. Here's an example image taken with the filter. You see three groups of sunspots, and I'm zooming in in one of these. In comparison, I have an image here from the same day taken with the Solar Dynamic Observatory, which is a satellite-based system. So this looks good, but what is the overall resolution of the meat in combination with the Leica CL? Usually in astronomy, the resolution is a measure of separating two close-by stars. I did, however, use a classical ISO test chart. There's absolutely no geometric or any chromatic aberration and no color fringing. The optical design does its job. However, I was not able to crop the images in a way I was used to, and the images get fuzzy very quickly. There are mainly two factors determining the resolution of the telescope. First, optical diffraction limitations and their relation to sampling the images. A quick back on the envelope calculation reveals the theoretical limitation of the need at 1.3 arc minutes, which results to about 8 micrometer in the focal plane. The pixel pitch of the Leica CL is approximately 4 microns. And for those of you familiar with optic engineering, will remember the Nyquist rule, which is fulfilled here. So we are sampling at the resolution limit in the way it should be done. One important other limitation, however, is air turbulence, which causes the twinkling of the stars. There is a factor, R0, which can be determined that defines the largest aperture you can use before the diffraction pattern is limited by turbulence in the air. This factor is typically around 200 millimeters, depends very much on the viewing conditions and stability of air masses. For imaging along the horizon, it can be as small as a few millimeters. With other words, small telescopes are mainly limited by the optical performance, but larger telescopes increasingly by air turbulence. So while turbulence is less of a concern for the ETX-90, we have to accept the high f-stop number, and we cannot squeeze anything out of the images by cropping. It results in an empty magnification. Another limitation is the 3.5 inch limited opening in its ability to image deep sky objects like nebula, galaxies, and faint star clusters. For long exposure times, you need to defork the ETX-90 and attach the telescope to a decent astronomical mount for mechanical tracking. This is an example how it looks like. I'm using a German equatorial mount, EQ3 from Orion, which holds up to 12 pounds. The combination ETX with the CL is about seven pounds. And the system is balanced by a counterweight. 
Thermonic uses a stepper motor for tracking, which extends the exposure time to the max of 30 seconds the Leica CL can do without problems. There's basically no limit how much you can invest into these mounts, computerized guidance, go-to functionality, and so on. Here's one example of the Orion Nebula M42, which is a relative easy object. I took 16 images, 15 seconds each, ISO 12500, and stacked the images with the Seville software. You can compare the results with the Orion Nebula shots from my first episode. And with this combination, a lot of fine structures become available in this jubilant interstellar cloud with reddish colors from hydrogen alpha emissions and blue-violet colors from reflections of light from massive, very hot stars in the center of the nebula. To summarize, the main three points to take home are, first, APC sensor cameras like the Leica CL are generally very suitable to be combined with beginner's telescopes, both for terrestrial imaging and basic astrophotography due to their relatively low weight and sensor size. Second, in case of the Mead ETEX 90, the images are diffraction limited as we would expect from an aperture of 13.8. The field of view is very small at the long focal lengths and you will need at least a sturdy video type tripod if you take the telescope off the fork. Third, some reviews have decried the aperture of this telescope is simply too small for serious astronomical imaging. The ETEX 90 is certainly limited in the ability to image faint objects and resolve finer details. If you get serious, about it, and if you plan to invest into an astronomical mount for tracking, you may also want to consider upgrading the telescope with an astrograph. So these are my conclusions. Until next time, clear skies.